It's just another day for Nathan Zakheim. And as usual, he is surrounded by millions of dollars worth of fine art. And surrounded may be an understatement. It's everywhere, leaning up against walls, stored on shelves, tucked away in back rooms. He is currently working on a retrospective of his father, noted artist Bernard Zakheim. Masters of the Renaissance and pieces representing other major periods, Baroque, the Neoclassics, Realism and Impressionism, Modern and Contemporary Art. They've all been through here. But this isn't a museum. This is part home and part workshop. A place where both great and unrecognized pieces of art are cleaned, restored, and conserved. I'm Nathan Zakheim, art conservator, director of Nathan Zakheim Associates. Well, I was raised in Sebastopol, California, Northern California, north of San Francisco, in a um, art colony or art commune known as Farm Arts, which means that there were artists in tents and cabins, chicken coops, buildings, impromptu structures, sprinkled amongst the apple trees which comprised the farm. I would say that during the time I grew up there, the, we had a larger crop of artists than we did of apples, because nobody knew anything about farming apples, but everyone thought they were Picasso. My father said he had two terrible fears. And when my father was a very artistic and emotional man, said he had fears, you sort of braced yourself to see what they were. The first fear, he said, was that I would not become an artist. So I said, ah, okay, he wants me to become an artist. And then the second fear, he said, was that you will become an artist, but become a greater artist than me. I said, oh, I think I should fix paintings, not paint paintings. The first project I ever did was I rescued a fresco that he had painted at the University of California Medical Center from the wrecking ball. And I invented the method for taking it out, which was later on copied and used in Florence, Italy after the floods. This was in 1966, when the floods were still, or the paintings were still damp from the Florentine floods. So he was very happy that I took it out. And he were, people constantly called him and said, you're, you're a muralist, tell me we have this mural that's in danger. So don't talk to me, talk to my son. So I'd go out and develop a method for dealing with the mural. And, um, that's how my career began. Artists all have a reason to paint. And even bad artists painting bad art have a reason to paint. And when I first started in conservation, I was very discriminatory. I said, well, I like working on this painting. I hate working on this one. Why do I have to work on this one except for the money, you know? But after a while, I began to catch on that the artist had a reason to do what he did. It may be a stupid reason, it may be a sentimental reason, but as I began to get more and more psychically attuned to the paint strokes and the gesture, the colors, the choices, either ad deliberate choices or inadvertent choices, when I actually began to understand that the art, what the artist was doing, I began to become in awe of every piece of art. That I see his broken dreams. I see his shallowness trying to explain himself out of his own shallowness. I see how he's trying to speak to someone else and not knowing if his words will be heard because they're not words, they're colors and paints. After a while, I'm sitting there feeling compassion for this person, feeling fellowship with this person, commiserating with this person admiring this person for his attempt to reach out to others. I became entranced by trying to understand chemistry of a painting, a visible, tangible work of art that people like to look at, not from how it looks down to the canvas, 
but rather the other direction, from the canvas up to the eye. So I began to do molecular solutions. You have to actually see them in your mind's eye. And you'll see them combining. And seeing them becoming attached to one another or adjacent to one another or forming magnetic or anti-magnetic relationships to one another. I have done magnificent work on the most incredibly different pictures that were worth millions of dollars, the painting, and they paid me a great deal to work on it. And I take the painting back to the client, like trickles of blood sweating out of my pores, walking in, he's going to die with pleasure. And I put it up there for him to look at. And I stand back, waiting for the applause. And he looks at it. He's a connoisseur. He's got millions of dollars to spend on art. It was darker before, wasn't it? <laughs> I am so amazed. It was darker before, wasn't it? But that's the humorous reaction to a guy that doesn't even have the slightest idea what I did. So I realized I did it for me. And I did it for the next guy. He's not going to live forever. And the work I did on the painting takes it from a 10-year life expectancy to a 3,000-year life expectancy. Somewhere along those 3,000 years, the guy's going to say, you know, some primitive chap back there in 1987 did a really good job. I always give what they expect of me or what I've agreed to do, and then some. It's absolutely required. You cannot do, if anyone who does 67, 80% will end up getting $25 to restore a painting. It's just the way that is. The gods of paintings are watching. They don't approve of such skimpiness. But anyone who takes on a painting for $2,000 and does work for which he could easily have charged three and doesn't charge three, but charges the two that he agreed to and is satisfied that $2,000 pays the bills. It doesn't get me the tuxedo, but it pays the bills. That gets you jobs that are worth a lot of money because people may not know you're doing it, but they sense that you're the sort of guy that they can trust. Geniuses are not always accessible. And fathers are not always accessible to their sons. I mean, everyone has a relationship with their father based on primordial and archetypal uh, impulses and instincts and desires. But when you have a father who's a genius and you want access to your father as a human, it doesn't always turn out that way. Where did his mind go when it went to those amazing places? How did he think that up? How did he even imagine such a thing? How did he get this idea and where did he get it from? How, you know, this sort of question would flood my experience. And a lot of that I never got answers for. I got my insight from my father's work when I was moving into the studio a few months ago because it was all a collection in storage. Then I started having to go through it and I decided by decade, I said, oh, he felt like that then. Oh, obviously he felt like that later. Then that happened. Then this is how he reacted. This is what came of it. Then he moved on to that. So I got to know my father long after he'd passed away. I wanted to meet him before he passed away. It was a little too much for me. It's like staring straight into the sun. You can do it, but you might end up blind. Thanks to Nathan's excellence in conservation, innovation, and efforts, perhaps future generations will be able to give voice to the thoughts and feelings that we could not but express through a brush, some paint, and a gesture towards a canvas.